Hello, and welcome back to the Modern Data Lake on MinIO series. In this session, we're going to be talking about data time travel. So just what do we mean by data time travel? Here, we're talking about the ability to query data within our data lake, not just as it looks right now, but as it may have looked at any time in the past, be it a week ago, a month ago, or a day ago. We do this by appending a snapshot ID or a timestamp to our SQL queries. A snapshot in this case can be thought of as a single point in time that we are referencing for our query results. So we understand what time travel is, but how does it actually work in our data lake? So when we're using an open table format like Apache Iceberg, the important takeaway is that Iceberg is going to split our data into three distinct layers. We're gonna have our catalog, our metadata, and our data layers. Starting at the top, let's look at that catalog layer, right? In our case, we're using Nessie as our catalog due to its amazing Git-like abilities to version control our data. And our catalog is gonna keep track of what tables we have and what metadata files are related. If we kind of go down a layer, we're gonna be in our metadata layer and we can think of this layer as a way to determine which snapshot point in time we wanna query and which data files in our object store we need to scan to provide a set of accurate and precise results to our end user. Using all this structured data and metadata, our query engine, whether that's Spark or Dremio Sonar or really any other query engine, it's easily able to keep track of the changes to our tables over time. So we understand what data time travel is, we understand how it works, but why is this useful? Well, there's a few scenarios that we wanted to highlight and showcase where this capability really shines. First, we have error recovery. By keeping track of all the states of the data and how it changes over time, we can easily roll back if we make a mistake. This just gives us a great peace of mind. There's also time series analytics. Traditionally in a data warehouse, if we wanted to keep track of how something changed over time, we would need to assign it a time dimension, an hour, a month, a second, etc. In this case, the iceberg and our data lake is going to do that for us. Then there's A-B testing. We might be a product manager and we might be looking at how a particular change on our website or e-commerce storefront has changed customer behavior or traffic. Well, again, this becomes a relatively trivial exercise when we can simply query the data at different points in time and compare the results. There's of course auditing and compliance. We wanna be able to track every change, who made it and when it was introduced. This becomes again, a fairly trivial exercise using this capability. Finally, we have machine learning and reproducibility. In machine learning, we're often experimenting with many, many different models, data sets, and hyperparameters. We wanna be able to say that our features that we trained our model on are the same today as they were yesterday. If I run the pipeline, I will produce the same results, same input, same output. Again, time travel makes that really easy. We can easily introduce a particular snapshot into our feature engineering pipelines and guarantee the output is precisely the same. We now have a good understanding of what data time travel is, how it works, and why it's useful. Now, let's get our lab environment set up and we'll see it in practice. Let's go ahead and create a table. And this table is going to be called fact underscore orders. It's in the Nessie catalog that was again created in that shell script. And it's gonna have four columns, an order ID, a customer ID, an order amount, and an order timestamp. We're also going to partition the data that's in this table by the day of the order, the day that the order was placed. So let's just imagine, again, it's a data warehouse kind of scenario. Every row in this table will represent a fact that occurred. That fact was a customer placed an order with a dollar amount at a particular point in time. Let's go ahead and highlight all of that SQL and hit run. And we will see that the table was created. We can now go and insert three rows into that table. It's, a, it's an empty table, uh, at least initially. Uh, and to give the example a little, little more character, we're going to go ahead and insert a few rows. These rows, again, we have our customer ID, our order ID, our dollar amount, and then the timestamp. And notice that there are two dates, two orders that were placed on January 7th. One order was placed on the 8th. Using our partitioning scheme, we would expect two partitions to be created, one since it's, we're using a daily partitioning strategy. So let's highlight this whole section over here. Let's hit run. Sure enough, we get three rows inserted. Just to prove that that worked as we would expect, we will write a select star from that particular table. 
and we should see our three rows represented. Yes, we do. We see our order ID, customer ID, amount, and timestamps. Perfect. We're going to take a quick detour here. We're going to switch back to the terminal, uh, and we're going to take a look at the data that our data lake stack is managing for us. We're going to look at the structure and hierarchy. Uh, it'll give us a little more understanding of what Iceberg is doing for us. So if we clear our prior output, we're going to use a command, minio command mc tree. And tree is a command that prints out the files at the particular path we're giving it, the particular bucket and uh, uh, object path. And in this case, we're pointing it to, again, minio one server, bucket named warehouse, table fact orders, which itself is a path in that particular uh, bucket. And what we see when we execute that command is a directory called metadata and a directory here, which represents the actual data itself. And so if we look under the actual data itself, we'll see there's two partitions, one for the seventh, one for the eighth, precisely as we'd expect. So there's basically a parquet file, which contains the actual real data in our tables in each of those. There could be in a production cluster, hundreds or thousands of these easily. We're also going to see a metadata folder, which is Iceberg is using to track our metadata. And Dremio, in this case, Dremio has its own compute engine called Sonar, is interacting with Iceberg to make sure that all of this data is mapped correctly. If we want to go ahead and actually look at the details of the metadata, we can do so. So we can say mccat, cat is the very similar to the Linux or Unix command cat. It'll spill out the contents at the path given to the standard out. Let's go ahead and grab this metadata over here. This second metadata file, which is the most recent one, it's got that 0001 indicator there. And what we see when we do that is a lot of metadata. It's, it's in JSON format. It's got the schema. It's got the uh, last updated timestamp. It's got the location. Uh, we have prior schemas, partitioning schemes. We see snapshots, which again, what are snapshots? Snapshots are point, point in time representations of our table. So Iceberg is tracking all of this for us. The key takeaway here is not to understand all the details of how Iceberg manages this data, but rather to understand that it is doing so, that it is keeping track. We no longer have to think about objects and partitions directly. We can just operate on tables and write pure SQL if we so choose. With that out of the way, let's go back to our browser and let's continue our time travel exercise. We're going to execute a query here against a table that Dremio automatically creates and manages for us called table underscore snapshot. And that's going to show us the snapshots that are created. Again, snapshot point in time. As we would intuitively expect, there are in fact two snapshots being shown. And that's because the initial table creation created an empty table. That's one snapshot, the top row. It's got this snapshot ID. Uh, and then the second operation where we inserted three rows created another snapshot with its own snapshot ID. Let's go ahead and make a very targeted update. What we mean by that is suppose we decided that we wanted to update the fact underscore orders table with a dollar amount of $100 even where the order ID equals 112. So we can highlight that statement and run it and we see that the row was successfully updated. If we now go ahead and execute our the same SQL that we just ran, we're going to see that there's now three snapshots. And as we would expect, that third snapshot has an operation type overwrite, and it's gonna have its own new snapshot ID indicating that we overwrote a row with a new piece of information, a new value for that order amount, $100. Now we're going to query the table in a prior state. And what do we mean by that? Well, what we mean by that is we're going to look at the table as it looked before we made our update to set that particular row, that particular order to $100. So if we grab this snapshot ID, which is the second row, which maps to the point in time just prior to our update being executed, and we copy that selection and we replace that with a snapshot ID, we should see the the table not in its current state, but in, in, the, in its prior state, which was not $100, but $67.15. We can likewise do the same thing with timestamps. So we can say select, for example, star from Nessie.fact 
orders at timestamp, and then we can provide a valid timestamp. Does the same thing. Uh, that's just convenience in case you don't know the exact snapshot ID. So that's time travel querying. We, we queried our data in, in the current and prior state. Let's now roll the table back, right? So suppose we no longer want to keep that change. We decided it was an erroneous update and we want to roll the table back. We can easily do that with the rollback table statement. So if we go over here and we simply copy the same snapshot ID, which was again the state prior to our update being made, we can roll the table back. It'll tell us that it was successfully rolled back. And if we simply do a select star without providing any snapshot ID, which will default to the current snapshot, the most recent snapshot, we will now see that it is back to $67.15. Our update to 100 has been rolled back. And that's it. That's time travel querying in a nutshell. Very simple, very straightforward. Hope you enjoyed that. I suggest keeping your data lake stack running in its current state because we're going to continue using it in the next section. Hope to see you there. Thank you so much.